as a backup. There we go. Okay. 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 So yeah, I mean, well, I, I can guess I can certainly send, send you a link to it at yeah. the end. Sure, that would be great. So just to give you a little bit of a rundown of what we um, were kind of working on. So I've been covering cryptocurrency um, mm -hmm. kind of broadly at Motherboard, and it's a big topic area for Motherboard because we're a tech tech outlet. Um, mm -hmm. And my my editor kind of flagged for me this growing kind of attention being paid to seed oils among the crypto mm -hmm. community, oddly enough. Um, mm -hmm. And was kind of like, what's the deal with this? What's, uh, you know, why, how does this, why, why is this kind of caught on? And why, what are the sort of values of this that really align with the values of a lot of folks who really are into, into crypto? And, um, and then we kind of got looking into it. And um, I think um, I, I know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of science out there. A lot of it really goes over my head. Um, so I'm going to ask you some questions about that about in layperson's terms, but um, mostly I'm also just curious kind of what brought you to this and your sort of mm -hmm. how your own kind of life has changed since you adopted anti-seed oil, you know, mentality, mentality values, uh, principles, I don't know, behaviors. Um, so yeah, can you well, just- Well, let me, let me just, sure. I was thinking about this when I was shaving this morning. I do shave <laughs> <laughs> and, uh. This potentially for a journalist, you know who Rachel Carson is? Mm -hmm. You know who Gary Taubes is? Um, no. He's a big health journalist. Nina Tichholz? Mm -hmm. Yes. This could be bigger. This is a bigger story than anything that they did. Mm. No exaggeration. Um, and we'll go through that. But just to get your attention, this is like, if you do it right, a career making story for a journalist. We've got hidden, I mean, Malcolm Gladwell's covered this, you know, aspects of it, but nobody's actually, except for me, kind of gone through and put all the pieces together and started talking about it. And that's why it's become a big deal in the Bitcoin community because of my efforts over the last many years to try and get the story out. And that's why it's been compelling to people because when they start understanding the whole thing, it really gets your attention. Yeah. So. So can you start by telling me what kind of what what how you started, what kind of put you onto this and what, how your knowledge has evolved over the years? Well, I started out as somebody who had no interest in nutrition or diets or anything else. I was a uh, chief technology officer at a hedge fund in New York and largely self-taught in technology. Um, it was at the time one of the top 100 hedge funds in the world. So it was I think they're still in business, Mariner Investment Group. Um, so, you know, I was just chugging along, doing my work, um, and I started getting really sick. And um, when I was 38, I was initially diagnosed with having a stroke. Um, when I was four, when I was, which led to four days in a stroke ward out at Westchester Medical. Um, when I was uh, 40, I had acute diverticulitis, which led to a colon resection. And a couple of years later, I found a blog of this researcher who started talk, who got me interested in the whole topic of diet and health. Um, and I started following it. And at that point, I had been sick with irritable bowel disease for 16 years. Um, and one of his issues was uh, vegetable oils. And so one day I went down to the cafeteria at work up in White Plains. And I said, you know, I got to the end of the um, uh, salad bar. And I looked at these squeeze bottles of salad dressing. And I said to myself, well, that's got to be the cheapest, crappiest oil known to man in those oh, yeah. things. <laughs> right? um, and I said, what, hap what happens if I listen to this guy and I just start eating it? And Two days later, my 16 years of irritable bowel disease was gone, which wow. absolutely blew my mind. And then I started seeing all of these follow on health benefits. I lost all of my extra weight in about two months. You know, I put on my pants one morning, buckled up my belt, and let go, and they fell to the floor. Mm -hmm. um, and I just kept, you know, getting healthier. And I got really interested in why it was happening, you know, because as a self-taught engineer, I was used to 
having to drill down on topics. And, you know, I was one of the first guys in the hedge fund community to build a private cloud and adopt cloud technology and do a lot of other things first in the industry, because I would do my own research and I would figure out what was the right thing to do. So I just said, okay, well, this is something new that I need to learn about so I can understand what's going on to myself. And then as I started having impact on other people I was talking to first in the office and then, you know, in my family and then out as I started talking to people on the internet, I started realizing what a big issue this was. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just been getting more and more traction over the years. Okay. So if we were to, you know, you say this is a big, a big story for a journalist. Um, I guess I'm sort of interested in who the players are here. If this is something that, um, you know, they're, everybody's consuming these oils that are, that are harming us, um, who is to kind of blame? Like what is, how do you sort of, from a broad level, how do you see this story? Well, so it started back in the 1800s. Okay, just to, <laughs> it's literally a big story. Yep. Um, cottonseed oil was originally a waste product of the cotton business, right? Cottonseed oil was very toxic. Um, in the natural form, it's, it has this uh, toxin called gossypol. And it was very toxic to people. You could feed it to animals. Um, then they figured out how to remove the gossy pall from cottonseed oil, and they started using it to adulterate lard, right? So this was prior to the FDA. And, um, you know, they just, it was cheap. It was literally a waste product. And they realized, hey, if we can start feeding this to people, we can sell it to the lard companies and we can, you know, make money. Um, so they wound up having congressional hearings in the United States over the adulteration to the lard market and parliamentary hearings in Canada, all of which are available online, looking into this problem. The Canadians said every single, virtually every single lard product, I think all but one that they were receiving from the United States was adulterated with cottonseed oil. So they started passing laws about how you had to, you know, disclose that you were using lard. And so this con the consumption of cottonseed oil was going up kind of without anybody really realizing it. At the same time, we started seeing these epidemics of chronic disease, cancer, diabetes, um, heart disease were all going up, right? The American Heart Association and the American... Uh, Cancer Association, I guess it is, were both started in the early 1900s. Um, there are lots of papers written in medical journals, entire books on why, why, you know, are we having these sudden increases in cancer and heart disease? We don't understand what's going on. Um, and it kind of, you know, progressed. Nobody really realized what was going on until much later, right? So it was, in a sense, innocent in that um, you know, when Procter & Gamble started marketing Crisco in 1911, Crisco stands for crystallized cottonseed oil, um, they thought that they were doing a good thing, right? They had made a toxic waste product into something that was suitable for food. And, um, you know, it seemed to be a good thing. It was cheaper than the animal fats that we were running out of at the time. Um, one of the things that they noticed was that um, vegetable oils lower LDL. When you start feeding somebody vegetable oils, they um, their LDL goes down, right? So we've got this epidemic of heart disease. They're trying to figure out what to do. They've come to the conclusion that cholesterol is in some way associated with it. Because when you go in and you look at somebody who's died from a heart attack, typically they would have these cholesterol plaques which are composed of many things other than cholesterol, but cholesterol is one of the main ingredients. And they were trying to figure out how do we slow it down? So they started recommending that people, you know, start consuming um, seed oils. So one of the fellows who had a heart attack, who became kind of the center of this whole story was uh, President Eisenhower. So he had a heart attack when he was in office. This became a big deal, obviously. Um, and somehow he heard that corn oil would lower his risk of heart disease. 
right? So he started having his doctors replace all of his animal fats with corn oil. He had several more heart attacks and he wound up dying in, I think it was 1968. Now in the early 1960s, there was a researcher who published something called the Rose Corn Oil Trial, where he took a bunch of people and replaced their regular diet with a diet of corn oil. And what he discovered was that it did indeed make their LDL cholesterol go down, but it also caused their caused more of them to die of heart disease. Right. Interesting. So that was the first of a number of studies looking at replacing fat, saturated fat from animals mostly in the diet with vegetable oils that found that the vegetable oils actually cause higher mortality rates, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that brings in at about the same time, there was a researcher named Ansel Keys who was a big fan of this idea that saturated fat caused heart disease and he recommended increasing your intake of um, vegetable oils and lowering your intake of animal fats. Um, he became very influential in the American Heart Association, which in 1961, prior to this rose corn oil trial, started recommending that people cut back on saturated fat, start increasing their vegetable oil intake. Um, so that's became the standard recommendation, right? That's why they've been at it ever since. Um, Keyes did a couple of studies testing this hypothesis. One was the seven country study, which is very famous in the heart, in the cardiology community. The other was a national study. Um, and I can't remember the name of it right now. I think it was the national cholesterol trial or something. That, um, I can get you that bit of information. But part of it, it was broken up into a bunch of different research centers around the country. One of them was known as the Minnesota Coronary Survey. Keyes was a scientist up in Minnesota. And so this was run by the American Heart Association. You know, the entire scientific and medical establishment was behind this big nationwide trial study to figure out if they could affect the rates of heart disease um, by changing the diet. So the Minnesota Coronary Survey released this, you know, they didn't release anything about this for a long time, for about 15 years after the study ended. And then when they did, Keyes didn't, even though he was one of the principal investigators on it, he didn't sign it, which is very interesting because when we get to the 2000s, a researcher at the National Institute of Health, uh, followed by the name of uh, two fellows, Joseph Hibbeln and Christopher Ramsden, had gotten into this topic of the health of vegetable oils. Um, they are originally alcohol, alcoholism researchers. Mm. And it's well known in the community studying alcoholism that um, the fats in the omega-6 fats, which is, you know, a type of fat, we've heard of omega-3 fats in fish oil, omega-6 fats is another type of fat, um, made uh, liver failure from alcoholism worse, right? And if you try and induce liver failure in an animal model, you have to include these fats. Um, and that if you don't, you know, if you just give mice tallow as the fat, they can eat up to like 30% ethanol, believe it or not, without getting liver failure, right? So they've, you know, you read these papers, linoleic acid, which is this specific fat, is required to induce liver failure in experimental models of alcoholic liver disease. So that's kind of how that group got into this topic. So what did they do? They started doing a, what you call a meta-analysis, where you look at all of these different studies and you try and combine the results to get an idea of what is going on, right? Mm -hmm. So what they realized was that two of the studies that, that, that had looked specifically at adding vegetable oils for heart disease didn't have great results. So they started drilling down into the Ansel Keys, Minnesota um, coronary survey, and they discovered that they'd never published the actual results on mortality, right? They said that it lowered 
the blood cholesterol, the LDL, which it does pretty consistently. But they also discovered that the people who had the intervention, who were fed more corn oil, had higher mortality. Mm -hmm. And that they'd actually published inside the university a study by a, you know, a master's thesis looking at this. Nobody had ever seen this research before until Ramsden went and talked to the son of the other principal researcher and found, you know, literally Malcolm Gladwell did a podcast episode on this called The Basement Tapes because they literally went down into this dead researcher's basement. They hadn't closed, finished, you know, shutting down the estate yet and got all of his research that nobody'd seen in years and discovered, oh my goodness, this was actually, you know, the definitive test of the healthfulness of vegetable oils failed. Yeah. Right. So he finally started, he finally, um, Ramsden and Hibbel finished their meta-analysis in 2016 and released their results that no, none of these studies that were done that specifically looked at vegetable oils and heart disease had ever shown any benefit. And a number of them had shown clear signs of harm. Um, so that was in 2016, the, you said? 2016. Okay. So how do the, how the authorities react to this? Well, they try and bluster and ignore it and obfuscate the results. They, you know, so there's two main types of these, there's omega-6 and omega-3 PUFAs, polyunsaturated unsaturated fatty acids, right? So the way that they try and obfuscate these findings, omega-3 fats are thought to be good for heart disease. Omega-6 fats are at best no good and may be bad for heart disease. So what they do to hide the results of the omega-6 fat trials is they combine the two together, right? And they say, oh no, PUFAs are good for you, right? Because if we look at these trials where both were increased, then we can show benefits in some of the trials. And then we're going to just, you know, I mean, read the research they go through in some cases, just outright lies to try and ex explain why they're ignoring some of these studies that show a negative effect of these vegetable oils. Um, so now at the same time, we have this hypothesis that LDL causes heart disease. Um, two researchers, Brown and Goldstein, discovered this back in the 1970s, discovered something called the LDL receptor, which they went on to get a Nobel Prize for. Um, also in the 1970s, they tried to show that LDL would initiate the first step of atherosclerosis, right? So what they did, it, the first step of atherosclerosis is when your white blood cells turn into what's called a foam cell, right? And they do that by hoovering up, you know, en engorging themselves in the fats and cholesterol that are in LDL. So what they did was they took some white blood cells and they combined them in a vial with LDL cholesterol and expecting that they would turn into foam cells, but they didn't. The experiment failed, right? So what they found was that if you modified LDL and they did a synthetic modification, something that wouldn't actually happen in the body, that the white blood cells would hoover up all the LDL that they could get their hands on and turn into foam cells, right? So what they realized was that LDL per se didn't initiate heart atherosclerosis. It had to be modified. Two other researchers um, in the 80s, uh, Steinberg and Whitstone, they finally figured out what actually happened in the body that caused the LDL to become modified. And they realized that the fats in the LDL became oxidized. And when the that oxidation was the modification that actually happened in a living organism that would cause the white blood cells to hoover up the oxidized LDL and become foam cells and initiate atherosclerosis. And they did a couple of experiments, first in rabbits and then in humans. And the human, you know, both of those have been replicated numerous times. And what did they discover? They discovered that the oxidized fats that caused the LDL particles to become atherogenic were the fats and seed oils. 
And that if you took animals or humans and you fed them two diets, one with olive oil in it and the other one with vegetable, you know, seed oils in it, that that would initiate the change in the LDL that would kick off the process of atherosclerosis. And they published those results. Brown and Goldstein turned around and published a paper saying, look, they've solved the problem. And as far as I've been able to figure out, um, that's the only explanation for what initiates and causes heart disease to progress. The European Atherosclerosis Society in 2020 released a consensus statement referencing those papers and saying, this is the first step of atherosclerosis initiation, right? And the definition that's used in medicine of an oxidized LDL, the test that is used for it, looks for oxidized omega-6 fats in the LDL particle. So we're talking about vegetable oil, but we're not just talking about vegetable oil. We're also talking, what else are, what, what else is, um, contains seed oil that's included in this? Well, a, a seed oil is an oil that comes from seed, right? And we call it that to differentiate it from like olive oil that comes from the fruit of the olive or avocado oil that also may basically comes from the fruit. Whereas seed oils come from corn oil or soybean oil or, um, you know, cottonseed oil, obviously rice bran oil, all of these oils that are made, you know, by refining the fats out of a seed. Um, so processed foods obviously include those. Um, animals are fed grains and, you know, these oils um, because they're cheap. So for instance, pork and chicken have, you know, they tend to, con the, like humans, the more of the stuff you eat, it bioaccumulates. So another researcher did a great study looking at, actually the guy who got me into this originally, Stefan Guillenet, did a really neat study working with Joseph Hibbelm, the fellow at the NIH who had uh, reanalyzed these cardiovascular disease studies had looked at the increase in seed oils in the American diet and they looked at adipose samples and they found out that as the um, fat intake from seed oils has increased over the 20th century, it bioaccumulates in the human body. It also bioaccumulates in pork or chicken that are fed these fats, right? Because there's some odd associations in the literature that don't make any sense where, you know, as people have increased their intake of chicken, which, which is supposed to be healthy, disease risk has increased, you know, why does that happen? And, you know, my hypothesis and the hypothesis of a lot of the scientists who have been writing this research is it's because of the seed oils. Now, in addition to um, the cardiovascular literature, um, there's similar studies to the um, alcoholic liver disease studies looking at different types of cancers where they find that these fats are required for inducing cancer in animal models, right? And for instance, one of them is breast cancer. Now, breast cancer is obviously one of the major kinds of cancer. It's also one of the cancers where we have studies that look at populations eating a more traditional diet, which of course doesn't include industrially produced seed oils. And when they move from say Asia to the United States. In Asia, traditionally, they would have fairly low rates of breast cancer. But when they moved to the United States, their rates of breast cancer would increase over a couple of generations until it was the same as the American rate, right? As they would start adopting the American diet. We have colon cancer studies where they find the same thing in immigrants to the United States. Colon cancer goes up faster than any other type of cancer. Um, you know, Japanese, for instance, coming from Japan, which at one point had a low rate of colon cancer, moving to Hawaii, their rate would go up to the same as the American rate. And the more of the American diet they ate, the faster their rate of colon cancer would increase. Um, we have this increase in lung cancer that's going on all around the world. There are, you know, obviously the primary cause of lung cancer is smoking, right? Smoking is primarily done around the world by men. Men are mo therefore more predisposed to getting this, you know, the type of lung cancer that's typified in people who smoke. But there's another type of lung cancer called an adenocarcinoma 
that is more commonly found in women. And they started noticing this in China, that Chinese women had this high rate of this other type of lung cancer, but they never smoked, right? So they did a lot of research in this. They did a lot of animal studies. And in 2010, the International Agency for Research into Cancer listed cooking oils as a known animal carcinogen and a probable human carcinogen because cooking oils release the same toxins that you find in cigarette smoke. So if you're you know, a Chinese lady cooking over a wok all day long in a poorly ventilated you know, house, you are increasing your risk of uh, lung cancer. And all around the world, we're starting to see this increase in lung cancer in women. And the, you know, the explanation at the moment is it's the cooking oils that are causing this increase in this cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably, <laughs> what'd you say? I said, wow. Um, yeah, another and thing Probably the most interesting thing, this was a study that I found in, a, that came out of the Harvard School of Public Health. Let me share my screen here. Um, I wrote a blog post about this. Um, Uh, here we go. I wrote a blog post about this after I found this study. So can you see this? Yep. So I reformatted the data in the paper because they weren't, they misrepresented essentially what was going on, right? But what we see here, this is looking at increase in obesity in the United States over some large data sets. Um, you may have heard of something called the nurse's health study. It's pretty famous. So they looked at the different foods that people were eating and they found that by far the most obesogenic foods were potatoes and potato chips. But that if you ate, you know, boiled potatoes, mashed potatoes, baked potatoes, right? That they're not particularly obesogenic. So what's the difference in ingredients between these two things, right? Obviously, French fried potatoes and potato chips are both fried in seed oils. That's how they're made. So we have this big study coming out of Harvard where they attempt to hide the results and misrepresent the, the results in the paper. They say, oh, it's because of the increasing carbohydrates in the potatoes. But if you compare a, you know, a baked potato to a potato chip or to a French fry, the biggest change is the increase in the seed oils, right? They absorb the seed oils that they're fried in. Um, so one, what, one other question I, that I've been thinking yeah. through, because I've also heard like almond milks and non-dairy milks mentioned in this. Um, are there any other non kind of like that can products that contain seed oil that you wouldn't think of as being oils? Well, there's lots of things have it as like trace amounts, like soy lecithin, which you'll see in just about everything is an emulsif emulsifier that's made from soybean oil. It's used in trace amounts. It's not, I don't think material. Um, pretty much everything, you know, if you go, I mean, bread now contains seed oils. They've, because of the dietary guidelines, they have gone and reformulated most foods to get rid of the use of animal fats and butter. Um, in India, for instance, they've replaced ghee, which was their, traditionally preferred fat with seed oils. Um, you know, it's, it's literally in everything. If you walk around and you start looking at the ingredients, it, it's a little overwhelming. Um, so how do you recommend, I mean, when you talk to people about this stuff, what do you recommend they, they swap out? I recommend that you avoid seed oils across the board because we really don't know, you know, in the beginning of the century, people were eating one or two or three percentage of their fats from this um, back when, you know, before the cancer and heart disease and obesity epidemics and the diabetes epidemic got going. Nowadays, we're up from people are eating from eight to 20% of their diet as these vegetable oils. Um, so, my recommendation, Ramsden, that, you know, the same researcher at the NIH, 
he did a study recently where he looked at people who had uh, migraines and chronic headaches, and he was able to significantly improve their headaches by reducing their intake of vegetable oils. He got their intake of omega-6 fats down to about 2% of the diet, and they discovered an increase better than what they could get from drugs in treating their headaches. Dr. K actually uh, suffers from migraines and has seen the same thing same thing personally, since he started cutting out seed oils a few months ago. Um, so, so yeah, it's, you know, we're talking about avoiding processed foods. We're talking about making so, sure that the oil that you personally cook with is olive or ideally like a cold pressed olive oil. Um, are we talking mm -hmm. about, um, or an avocado an avocado oil or butter, okay. which is what okay. I use. Okay. Um, um, which is interesting because you'd think that, but like you'd think an oil would be healthier than a butter, but I guess not. Well, if you look at the, you know, what seems to be driving this, you know, if we look at like uh, a low carb diet, um, have you ever heard of a company called Verta Health? Mm -mm. Okay, so Verta Health is was started by Sammy Inkening, who's a Finnish billionaire who started this company, Trulia, this real estate listing company, right? Mm -hmm. So he got interested in this topic and um, started working with two of these low carb low carbohydrate researchers, um, and they've been able for the first time in medical history they've been able to help people put diabetes into remission and to, you know, significantly reduce their body weight successfully and sustainably over time and reduce all of their disease risk markers, their cardiovascular disease risk markers. And they have two interventions. One of them is to go lower carbohydrate and the other one is to avoid seed oils, right? And why did they decide to do that? Because Steve Finney, who was one of the low carb researchers did a study back in, I think, the 1980s or 1990s, where, you know, he was one of the first guys who was trying to figure out about, you know, it, what are the health implications of a low carb diet. So he put the cyclists on a low carb diet, and he raised their fat intake. And for the fat, they started off using mayonnaise. And what he discovered was the mayonnaise made everybody sick, it made them nauseous, right? So he started experimenting on himself <laughs> through a tube in his nose, feeding himself different fats overnight. And what he discovered was if he fed himself um, olive oil or animal fats, that he was perfectly fine. But that if he fed himself seed oils, it made him sick, mm. right? So he's based on that personal experimentation, Verda recommends that people avoid these oils. Mm. And it has clear, well-demonstrated health benefits. I mean, the American Diabetes Association has started changing their dietary recommendations based on the results that Verda has achieved in diabetics. Prior to Verda coming along, it was considered basically impossible to reverse diabetes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really, that's really astonishing. I'm just, I want to be conscientious of time because I know you of course. have to go Thank at 9.45. Um, yep. Okay. So, so that's of, the big spiel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. It's so helpful. I would ask, actually, I don't know if you have like a folder with all of the papers that you have, you know, compiled over the years. Some of this stuff I, I can look up on my own, but I, if you have anything handy that you think is kind of essential reading papers that you've referenced that are essential reading, I'd love to check them out. Um, that you, that well, you what I can do is I will go back through this recording and I can, all the stuff that I've discussed, I can send you. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, and I can also that... link you to some, uh, as I said, this is a big story. I can put you in touch with um, some of the researchers, some of them I have direct access to, and some of them I have secondhand access to. I've never been able to get in touch with Ramsden, for instance, but I interviewed one of his co-authors, um, you know, so you may be able to get to Ramsden and Hibbel in that way. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah. yeah, don't take, don't, yeah. 
don't take my word for any of this, right? <laughs> Seriously. Um, one thing I wanted to quickly touch on that Dr. K mentioned yesterday that I found interesting was sunburn. Um, he said there's a correlation between <laughs> reducing seed oil and sunburn, which I, I had never, never heard, but um, what's your sort of take on that? Well, so that was the, that was what made me decide to stop um, taking these oils in the first place is that uh, Stefan Guiennet, who for reasons I don't understand, well, I do kind of understand, but we won't get into that, um, deleted this post, but I have a copy of it where he looked at the animal evidence for skin cancer. And it turns out that in animal models of skin cancer, you can control how fat the animal or how fast the animal gets skin cancer by how much um, polyunsaturated fats, omega-6 polyunsaturated fats you feed them. And they figured out that omega-3 polyunsaturated fats are protective against skin cancer, right? So I did this not, you know, so anyway, I didn't really, I had heard some accounts back, you know, 12 years ago when I got into this about this and I kind of poo-pooed them because it sounds crazy. And I'm a skier. I don't like to use sunburn. I mean, you can see my complexion. I'm like the perfect candidate for a sunburn. Mm -hmm. um so i went out skiing one day in march on a bluebird day right no clouds in the sky and i came home and i didn't get a sunburn i hadn't put any sunscreen on i was like hmm, that's kind of interesting and then a um couple of weeks later several weeks later my ex-wife uh who was colombian with you know dark skin and I went to an event in New York City and stood outside in the sun in Central Park for two and a half hours. And when we got back, she said, you know, she said to me, look at the sunburn that I got. And I said, look at me, I didn't burn at all. Now I would, uh, prior to that, I would have burned in about 45 minutes. Um, and it was a big deal because she loved the beach and I wouldn't go to the beach for the same reason that a, you know, the lobster doesn't want to go in the pot. Um, and then here we are standing side by side in the sun, perfect natural experiment. She burned, I didn't. And that was when I started to say, okay, this is a big deal. Now, 12 years later, I've used sunscreen once on the side of Mont Blanc in the French Alps when I was over there skiing with my daughter. And I moved to Texas for a year. I would go, you know, I um, run, I mountain bike, I would go for three or four hour runs out in the Texas sun. I live in Idaho in the high desert. Now I go, you know, backpacking up in the mountains, seven, eight hours in the sun. And I I'll get a little pink. Mm -hmm. It's been a game changer. And this is one of the things, you know, there's clear evidence in the scientific literature that omega-6 fats are involved in both sunburn and skin cancer. Mm -hmm. The primary one of the primary uh, genetic mutations in cancers, in all of these cancers, particularly in skin cancer, is this mutation of what's called the P53 gene. And that mutation is directly caused by some of the uh, toxins that are produced in your body from seed oil intake. So there's clear scientific evidence for it. And the anecdotal evidence from people who change their diet is just overwhelming. And Nobody, you know, I mean, that's part of the reason why this is a big deal in the Bitcoin com community is they became really interested in the carnivore diet a couple of years ago. And I went, one of the big figures in the carnivore diet is this Dr. Sean Baker. And Sean noticed that he wasn't, you know, that he was less susceptible to sunburn and all these other carnivores were reporting the same thing. And I went on Sean's podcast and I explained, okay, this is the reason this is happening. This is the scientific evidence for it. And yeah, it's, you know, you don't need to be a carnivore to do this. All you need to do is cut down on your seed oil intake. Mm. Um, yeah, and very quickly because you went there and I, this is also kind of the crux of what I'm reporting. Um, why do you think this has taken off in the Bitcoin community? Um, other than that, is there sort of like an ethos kind of thing or what's what's made this so popular? With that well, topic? it's I mean, I think it's primarily 
I'm not in the Bitcoin community, just FYI. In fact, I'm quite a skeptic about Bitcoin and getting lots of arguments with them online. But I think that the health benefits that people see from ditching the dietary guidelines recommendation are so consistent and so reliable and for a lot of people just so dramatic um i mean you know so my wife my current wife um she was a very ardent almost vegan organic farmer she had you know grew all of her own vegetables in upstate new york on her farm um and she was quite overweight and you know, when she switched her diet and adopted this, she lost 56 pounds in two and a half months and put her fibromyalgia, which is an autoimmune disease that she had suffered from for three decades into remission in short order, right? So when people start seeing stuff like that, it gets their attention, <laughs> especially if, you know, like me or like, my wife, you've been fighting this disease for years. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, when I fixed my diet, everything got better. Yeah. And it's, it sounds almost crazy. It sounds crazy. I will mm -hmm. be the first one to admit that it sounds crazy, but it has just been so consistent, um, you know, over the years and across all the people who try this stuff. And what's interesting now is that we're starting to see people who are doing what I did right? Because I, what I did, nobody else does or did, right? Which is the first thing I tried to do was take seed oils out of my diet. And I saw all these benefits. Now, a lot of people that this is getting more popular are doing that as their first intervention. And they're seeing all of these benefits, right? So it's helping us narrow down, you know, what is driving, what's the fix. And the fix in this case gives us a pretty good idea of what's driving the health epidemic in this country. Because I mean, you know, you look at the numbers, 90% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy, mm -hmm. right? That's overwhelming disease rate. Yeah. So the sense is that the, the kind of health benefits of this are just so, um, just so, so evident that um, this community has kind of just happens to have kind of latched onto it because it's kind of adjacent to carnivores or the, the, the carnivore diet. Um, do you see any sort of parallels between, you know, this kind of, I guess you could say it's like a healthy skepticism of our banking system of, you know, big systems that kind of got, like control the way that we live, including, um, you know, these big institutions that, that set dietary guidelines. Do you think any of that skepticism is kind of pervasive throughout both? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, you know, in this, when it comes to the particularly, you know, as I detailed in going through the, the research history of this, there's clear evidence of malfeasance, right? People coming up with negative results and just ignoring them or making excuses why you shouldn't ignore them or, are we still looking at this picture, by the way? Let me get yes, rid of this yeah. thing. Or, you know, looking at papers like this one coming out of the Harvard School of Public Health, um, where they're clearly trying to hide the data. And I mean, you know, part of my job when I was on Wall Street was uh, risk analysis and fraud detection. And, you know, in my opinion, if you were a fund manager and you did what these guys did in this paper, you would have the SEC down on you like a ton of bricks and you would be a candidate for getting walked out of your office in handcuffs. Mm, wow. And unfortunately, medical researchers Oh, and the neat thing about that study where they, you know, the Mosafarian 2011, and I'll send you that study. Guess who funded it? Oh. A major food manufacturer who's a major, was a major producer and sells an enormous amount of foods that include seed oils. Yeah. I mean, that's in all of this stuff. Um, that is really something you have to look out for. Um, so yeah, it absolutely plays into the skepticism and, you know, yeah, yeah. it feeds the skepticism because there's, this is something where, you know, we've got a hard 
line of evidence that they are how should we say this politely not doing what they ought to be doing <laughs> yeah, totally. um okay well i think we've covered a ton of ground i think those that's kind of the bulk of the questions that i had for you but is there anything else you'd like to add or anything that i missed um no i think that's pretty much it but i mean if i haven't made it clear already you know, I'm of the opinion that this is far and away the biggest health story of the last hundred odd years, right? I mean, if, you know, and there's an enormous amount of research out there. I mean, there are literally hundreds of thousands of papers on this topic. Um, and if we find, you know, and I'm of course convinced, I'm, I'm speaking like, a scientist is supposed to speak where you are everything's a provisional finding right okay. i'm convinced that the, i'm convinced of this evidence and i've talked you know i was talking to gary Tobbs about this the other day and he was like calling me out and he was oh goodness i haven't even touched on that bit of research um there's yeah there's a researcher in boston kathleen gura so they've been feeding, um, you know, some babies are born with what they call short gut syndrome, mm -hmm. where their small intestine is so small that they can't absorb food through it. Mm -hmm. So they have to feed them intravenously. And what they call, so I was just describing this in an email group that I'm in with um, a bunch of people. And Gary Tobbs called me out and he said, you know, you sound so certain, you sound like, you know, you're crazy. And I went through the research with him briefly. And I said, yeah, I think, you know, I know you're supposed to like hedge your bet and say, I am absolutely convinced that this is the biggest health story out there. And that this is the cause of the, you know, epidemics of chronic diseases that we're seeing in this country and around the world. So anyway, this researcher, um, these kids with short gut syndrome, they would feed them soybean oil intravenously, right? Mm -hmm. And what would happen to them? They would get liver failure and it would kill them. And so what she discovered is that if you don't, if you replace the soybean oil with fish oil, not only would it cure their liver failure, but they could live for years on it, right? This has been covered by uh, NBC Nightly News and the Wall Street Journal. The, the researcher who, or the doctor who runs this team called soybean oil, the white poison. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Right. Um, I would love to check that, check that out. Um, I'll send you the links. Else that you've sent. Yeah. I should probably bounce because I have another, another call at 10. I just need to prepare for, but um, thank you so much for your time and for walking me through all this stuff. I really appreciate it. And so early in the morning. No worries. It's a pleasure. And if you have any questions, um, I'm on email all the time. Yes. <laughs> have help me. Likewise, and, um, if anything else occurs to you, feel free to send me an email and yeah, we'll be in touch. Okay, great. Okay. Great talking okay. to you, Audrey. Have a you good too. day. Bye-bye.